Hi everyone, welcome back to Smug Mug Live. This is episode uh, 47. It's incredible that we're at episode 47 already. Our guest who joined us today last joined me on episode 9, so it's been a few months since we had uh, Michael here on the show. But before we head over to see Michael, thank you so much for joining Smug Mug Live. As always, it is brought to you by Smug Mug and Flickr. If you are looking for somewhere to showcase and show off your images online. If you're looking to store your images in the cloud, if you're looking to sell your images to clients and customers, then check out everything we have to offer at smugmug.com. Or if you're looking to be part of an incredible photo community, to be inspired and motivated by your peers, then head over to flickr.com and check out everything we have to offer there. Thank you so much, as always, for your support. I really enjoy it. At this point, I normally ask you to give your sh yourselves a shout out in the comments. Let us know where you're joining from. But boy, you're way ahead of me. You're already in there giving yourselves a lot of shout outs. And I can already tell that we have people joining us from all over the world. So wherever you are today, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining. Uh, it's going to be a great episode. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to have Michael back on the show. We have one more episode this week on Thursday this week, again, at 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific and 7 p.m. in the UK. We'll be joined by John Rourke, who is an incredible motorsport photographer with an incredible art for, for what he does. It's not just your standard motorsport stuff. We've had lots of requests for motorsport photography, so John is going to join us on Thursday and he photographs um, the endurance motorsport for the FIA. There is nobody better in his field, so really excited to have him join us on Thursday. But for now, let's see if Michael is with us. Michael, are you there? Hello. Michael. How's it going? Good. And you've got the like product placement in the first frame of your shot. <laughs> I did that on purpose. It, it didn't look like it was on purpose, <laughs> but I mean, you, you should never start a show holding a smug mug mug. That would just be like inappropriate, you know? Mm, I have that one too. I have that. Yeah. yeah. That mug. I like, I like these little guys a little bit more. I drink this every morning, but uh, you know, the uh, larger mugs, they're nice too. <laughs> you once told me that coffee only tasted good if it was in that particular mug and it was irrelevant what type of coffee it was. Yeah, pretty much. You can turn, uh, you can take like gas station coffee, throw it in the smug mug mug. Bam. It's like delicious, you know, pour over coffee. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully people, magic. people realize that we don't make mugs. That's not what smug mug is about. We allow our customers. You guys sell the mugs? No, our customers sell them uh, to, uh, to their clients with images and stuff on them. But uh, um, uh, let's not go down the coffee rabbit hole already. But let's have a look at, before we get started, let's have a look at where people are joining us from because uh, the chat is going crazy at the moment. Uh, we've got James joining us from Phoenix, Arizona, beautiful part of the world. Jeffrey is joining us from Gaithersburg. Not familiar with that one. I hope I haven't butchered that name. Rick is joining us from Lawton in Oklahoma, lovely part of the world. Uh, Craig is in Denver, Colorado. Joseph, All colors. yeah, Joseph has joined us from Hungary in Budapest, another oh, incredibly cool. beautiful part of the world. Patrick is in New Jersey, Ira's somewhere in California. And uh, let's see, photos are fun for me. Is joining us from Dallas. Photos are fun for all of us. So hopefully, uh, username. It's a, it's a great username. Uh, Rajiv is in Houston, a place that I know really well. Oh, no, he's not. He's from Houston, but is in the Bay Area. Two, two places I know very well. Um, mm. Patrick says, indeed, he is waiting for fall colors. Uh, Craig is joining us from Gilbert, Arizona. This is an interesting one. Adrenal Media is joining us from the UK. Adrenal Media is actually John Rourke, who I just mentioned at the top of the show, who will be joining us on Thursday. Hi, John. Thank you for checking in here. He said he was going to join today because he wants to learn how to do better time-lapse photography, and I'm sure that's why a lot of people are joining. So no pressure. Sweet. No pressure, Michael. Welcome. Uh, yeah. 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 I need to give... I need it's to just give, a casual conversation. Yeah. I need to give John Brown a shout out. John Brown is a great supporter of the channel, joins every time, every time, and he's from Dog Pound, just the best place uh, ever. I say that every time, but I just love, <laughs> I love the name. I'm hoping someday, John, that someone joins and says they're from the Cat Pound, but... Um, 
oh my goodness, there are so many, uh, so many people. Art B is joining from Indonesia. Fabian is from Italy. Uh, lots of Texans. Lots of Texans. Chris is from Texas. Deborah is from nice. Texas. Yeah, well... People from all over right yeah, now. Lots of people. Spain. Cesar is joining from Spain. My gosh, we could take up the whole show um, talking about who's joining us. Thank you so much for your, your support. We really do appreciate it. Uh, we could just do that instead for yeah, an hour. Just, just mention, mention who's location. joining. There must, there's probably already <laughs> a show on YouTube that's just like a phone-in and people just talk about each other. Um, so this show has a high level, a high chance that it's just going to be me and Michael talking nonsense for, for an hour or so, because when we get together, we just we just tend to talk nonsense. But hopefully within all that nonsense will be lots of golden nuggets uh, that kind of feed your interest uh, about time lapse photography. So if anybody doesn't know who you are, Michael, which I find hard to believe at this point. But if people don't know who you are, how would you describe who you are and what you do, your, your photography? Uh, <laughs> oh, I never know how to answer this one. Uh, I, okay, I thanks like for that. That was my... great, Michael. We, we get the, great, we get the awesome. idea now. <laughs> well, we'll just move on from that. No, uh, I usually just describe myself as a guy who likes to take pictures and make videos. And, you know, obviously that's pretty vague, but... I, I don't know. I just, I, I just like creating art, right? So you know, videos, time lapses, aerial, night sky, fine art, landscape photography. Um, I kind of like doing it all. I like just experimenting, and I guess I've kind of specialized a little bit more in time lapse and in aerial. And and you know, I found I found these things I really enjoy doing that then people kind of connect and attach to my name, like you know, with the night sky stuff and, and fog photography, but I really just like doing a little bit of everything. And I guess that kind of keeps it interesting for me too. Like I don't get burnt out on one thing, but, um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 mean, I never know how to describe myself to be honest. I kind of put you on the spot there, but I don't know how to describe you. So I thought I would ask you. How to do um, I, you know, I, really got to know you as uh, through your time-lapse photography. You know, when we, we started working together uh, at Smug Mug with you, your time-lapse yeah. photography, I, I think, is the best in the world. Um, Thank you so much. Hopefully make you blush a little nice bit, but it is phenomenal. And But the last time we had you on the show, we weren't talking about time-lapse. We were talking more about your editing of landscapes and, and night sky. Uh, we yeah. did some Milky Way editing and stuff the last time. So this time we wanted to specifically talk about time-lapse photography. And if anybody joined us a few weeks on, ago on the show, unfortunately, Michael couldn't join us, but we just released a Smug Mug film featuring Michael uh, and his time-lapse work. And uh, my colleague Anton joined me and we spoke a little bit about why we, we make the film and why we make the Smug Mug films that we do. Um, but unfortunately, you were you were on assignment uh, and couldn't couldn't join us at that point. But I do have a little trailer that I'm going to play for today's audience to entice them to go watch One Day One Artist featuring Michael Chamberlain. But don't go watch it now. Wait till after we've talked to Michael, then go watch it. But here's here's the trailer. So let's talk about the premise of uh, that particular One Day One Artist. Smug Mug Films is something we've been doing for about the last eight years where we spend a bunch of time with uh, our, our heroes, our favourite photographers, and we make these small movies about the work that they do, about their life, uh, and get quite deep into it. Obviously with the pandemic this year, we couldn't fulfill the plan that we originally had with yourself, Michael. So we were able to just spend a day with you, socially distant, and uh, local uh, and started uh, One Day One Artist where we literally spend 24 hours with uh, one of our photographers and uh, get a little bit of an insight into what they do that day. So tell us, what, what did we do with you uh, in San Francisco? We literally went for a hike, right? 
Yeah, the whole idea was, well, this was the first time I had really shot pictures since the pandemic started. And I really just wanted to get out with the camera. I had a goal in mind that I wanted to capture a time lapse and I wanted to capture a day to night time lapse. But really, the day was more about just getting out and going for a really nice hike and not worrying so much about it. So we actually hiked from my house in the Presidio across the Golden Gate Bridge through some of my favorite trails. And then we hiked up the headlands um, pretty high up above the entire city and the Golden Gate Bridge. And it's just such an amazing, you know, kind of hike to do, especially walking across the Golden Gate Bridge is a lot of fun. And um, as somebody who lives in San Francisco, it's not something you really think about doing. It's more of a touristy type thing to do. And I don't think tourists are using that as like a transportation device. They're mostly just going to walk on the bridge and then come back. But I actually have been finding it more fun to go across the bridge, like, you know, to actually go to hikes around Marin. So, yeah, yeah that was the idea. Um, yeah, and people then, don't, don't commute on foot across the Golden Gate Bridge typically, right? It's normally nose, not really. nose to tail in traffic, but it was, uh, and probably it's I've been on, I've probably been on the Golden Gate Bridge more times than most of my colleagues at headquarters because, you know, it still has a novelty to me when I visit. Um, but yeah, sometimes the places that you live, you explore least because, you know, they're, they are, uh, so well known to yourself, but it, it turned out great. Great little uh, little insight into you heading out uh, for the first time in a while uh, and creating some incredible time lapses. Um, something I forgot to check with you before we started the show. Do you have the day to night tam time lapse that you took available to you to 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 play Ooh. just now? Can you dig that? Uh, I have it on my hard drives on my raid system that is not connected yeah. to this computer unfortunately that's, that's a fail we'll need to, maybe i can uh should have should have set that up that was that was one thing i meant to set up was to show that day to time lapse but we can show some others that you that you have here we video. could also play it on the uh the, from the video too yeah we can we can cue towards that cue that up towards the end um before we get started uh talking about time lapses Again, a lot, I want a lot of this conversation to be led by you, the viewers. So if you have questions uh, for Michael, and I'm sure many of you have uh, some great, difficult, challenging questions for Michael, uh, the harder oh the better, he said. Uh, so um, put those questions in the chat window. Do me a favor though, start your question with the word question. Makes it super easy for me to find uh, the questions as they come in. But I think Michael's uh, pretty open to, to answering as much as as we can. Uh, I'm sure there's some contractual things with some upcoming work that we can't dive into. But, uh, you know, as far as gear and settings, I know before we even started the show, there was a question came in asking how you, uh, you manage to ramp uh, your exposure to cope with day to night type uh, time lapses. Uh, mm -hmm. So that would... Uh, be a great place to start but yeah get your questions in that chat window and we'll make sure to to ask michael them as uh, as we come across why don't we start with the typical kind of gear that you're using you know if you're going to go shoot a time lapse we can all shoot time lapses now with our mobile phones right yeah iphones yeah. and stuff yeah. allow you to shoot time lapse but you know they don't let you do it in 4k and they don't let you do it for you know hours how long how long would how long is the longest time lapse you've ever done Mm, ever done i've done time lapses that ran for like 48 hours wow. but it's a special setup to do yeah. a time lapse See, like that yeah. you need yeah external you know you need to plug into power and have a large enough yeah. card that's going to run that many files and then you just kind of let it run on yeah. kind of like a uh aperture priority mode um but yeah, we, yeah, but we're most doing, of my time lapse. We're not doing that length of time with our, our mobile phones and that type of stuff. And we're, we're not producing the incredible quality that you do. So what would be the typical gear setup that um, you would consider taking? You talk about it in the film a little bit, but you know, mm -hmm. what do you normally think of when you go? Yeah, I usually bring a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. And it kind of, to be honest with you, doesn't really matter that much. Um, what you're using, like I've used Nikon cameras, Canon cameras, Sony cameras. Um, I've used point and shoot cameras for time lapse by plugging in an intervalometer and just triggering the camera. And um, most of my 
shots are with like the D850 or one of the Sony mirrorless cameras and yeah so really any camera you have though like I could pick up a camera I could pick up like a Canon uh what is it Rebel XT I think that was like my first digital camera that I used years and years ago um I could pick that thing up again and run a time lapse that looks pretty decent on it probably <laughs> so yeah you just need a basically you just need the camera and a way to trigger the camera because you need to click images over a set interval um, so as long as you can trigger that camera to do that most a lot of the cameras the newer cameras have internal intervalometers that allow you to take the pictures over time without an external um, trigger remote but a lot of cameras especially the ones that i do still require like a remote to trigger the camera that's cool. And what about keeping things stable? You know, it's you're not doing this uh, handheld, right? So, what um, what do you normally take with you to keep things stable, or do you just use anything? Uh, oh, I've definitely, I've definitely used random objects before to stabilize the camera. I've put the camera on a rock. I've put the camera on the ground. I've you know found places to attach the camera, but usually you just want a tripod. Um, you know, a fairly stable tripod, but that's really dependent on the conditions. Like I use little travel tripods a lot of the times, but if it's windy, I probably want something a little bigger and more stable than that. And then, uh, as far as the, you know, to do, well, I'm sure we'll talk about the motion control of equipment, but I also use a pan and tilt head and a camera slider so that I can get those 3d moves through the landscape. But that's obviously a little bit different. Yeah, that, I mean, that's when you start getting more advanced and, and we will progress into that. But if someone's just starting out and, you know, you, you, I'm assuming your advice would be, yeah, don't go buy sliders and motions, you know, motors and stuff. What, what would you suggest people do to get started? Really just have a camera and preferably one that you're comfortable with already. Like if it's a camera that you like taking pictures with, it's gonna be probably a little easier to transition that camera into shooting time-lapse because you're already you know, pretty familiar with it. Um, and then yeah, just a tripod, a trigger remote, some sort of shutter release. And then probably the other thing I would recommend people look into, um, and we can talk about this more, but I, I like to do slight long exposures for most of my time lapses, not all of them, but I do find that dragging the shutter can help to smoothen out the time lapse. So um, perhaps an ND filter, like an ND six dot filter would be good just to have on hand for the time lapses. Make sure it's the right thread for your lens. Th those would probably be the, the most basic things that I can think of. Um, and then some things to consider too. One, Running a time lapse takes a lot more battery power, so you probably want some more batteries on hand. And um, running time lapses will run a lot of data on your memory card. So having a large memory card is helpful. Um, most of my memory cards, I don't think I have any that are under 64 gigs anymore, and a lot of mine are 128, so that I can just keep shooting time lapses and not run out of photos, you know, if I need to run the time lapse a little bit longer, because I pretty much shoot every single time lapse in raw. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've never done that. I'm sure you've never ran out of battery, and I'm sure you've never ran out of memory cards, right? So many times. <laughs> oh, and then one thing about the memory card, too, is having a memory card that's fast enough for the buffer speed to keep up. of the pictures clicking. Like, if you wanted to click a picture every one second, you're going to want a pretty fast memory card so that the memory card isn't trying to write the photo as the next one wants to click because you can run into issues um, for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, there's, there's a few questions here, uh, which is great folks. Thank you so much, especially for putting the word question at, at the start. You mentioned um, kind of neutral density filters so that you can uh, you know, really control your exposure. There was a question coming from Chris who asked, uh, polarizer preferences and when you choose to use them. So do you ever, do you use polarizers, which can have a neutral density effect? Obviously, you lose a you lose a stop with a polarizer typically. Yeah, about a stop. Um, I use CPL filters a decent amount. Um, they can be used for a numbered. I actually have a. I'm making a YouTube video about the filters that I use, and I so I actually just explained this in depth like two days ago, but to the camera instead of 
live. <laughs> um, basically, with the CPL filters, there's a few things I like to do with them. The first is they, they're great for enhancing rainbows. Um, they are great for cutting out reflections. So if there's like an unwanted reflection on the water and you want to see under the water, the CPL filters are amazing. So I use them all the time for stuff like that. Like if I'm shooting on a lake and I don't want to see the reflection, like maybe what's underneath the water is more interesting than the reflection itself. Um, I use it a lot in forest settings because when you're in like a lush rainforest and the foliage is wet, you can see those the kind of shine and reflections off the foliage. And um, if you twist the polarizer, you can get more vibrancy out of the foliage. So I do that quite a bit. And then uh, with the polarizer, the other thing that I do, which is what a lot of people do, is just use it on days where it's just a little bit hazy, where, where the sky doesn't have enough contrast. Um, if you point at 90 degrees from the sun, and I actually did this in the Smug Mug video that we were playing um, for... I think two of the shots in that video, I was using a polarizer to get just a little bit more contrast out of the sky. It was kind of a clear, sort of hazy day. And then I twisted the polarizer, got a little bit of those deep root, uh, got a little bit more of those deep blues in the sky. Yeah. yeah so cool. definitely a useful filter to have. Absolutely. Um, great question came in here from Ira, who says, how much time do you spend studying your prospective subject before you go to a time lapse? Mm, it probably varies. Um, if I am on a trip and I don't have a ton of time, I usually at least like to look around and scout for a few hours or a day. Um, I like most of the time, like when the lighting is not what I want, I'll just be like looking around, scouting, kind of just thinking about what I want. Um, I do spend a lot of time scouting at home too. Obviously there's only so much you can do with Google earth and Google maps and researching places, but I do try and do as much research before leaving, uh, as I can. But if it's something that I know I can come back to, like it's something local. I mean, I spend days and weeks, uh, shooting the same things and trying to get different variations and, tweaking the composition, like I'll go to the same places. Um, for example, there's actually a good example. So I put out a, like a, um, I put out a vlog recently that was like how I shoot seascape photography. But before I shoot the seas, before I shot the seascapes, I was shooting these like gnarled trees and they're really cool. And I photographed them once or twice before, but the lighting wasn't that great. So I went back on a day where the lighting was a little bit more diffused and I thought that was going to work. So I tried shooting it with diffused lighting. I recorded the vlog and I realized there's still something missing. So that was the third time that I'd photographed it. I, and I decided what I wanted for the shot was fog and that was going to help to isolate these trees. So I shot it in this foggy weather, realized that I still didn't like it. The fog wasn't in the right place. So I shot it two more times. So I've actually gone back to that same grouping of trees now six times and I think I finally got the conditions that I was looking for with it. But, you know, in total, I probably spent five or six hours of overall time just analyzing and trying to shoot those damn trees. <laughs> and I think I got it. But who knows? Like, maybe in a few days, I'll go back and re retry the trees again. Yeah. I'm not really sure. I'm, so there, it, it, it varies, yeah. you know, depending like on what I'm shooting. It's like any landscape. You know, you're not guaranteed the, the conditions at, at any single point. I guess the great thing with DSLRs and even even with iPhones, it costs us nothing to go try it and go practice. Um, you know, other than our own time, which a lot of us mm. have plenty of at the moment, unfortunately. But um, <laughs> true. it's uh, yeah, there's no there's no downside in going going practicing and trying it out and and honing your skills. You know, even if you don't get the exact conditions you want, at least you've you know you've spent the time doing it. I think what's that, funny is. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, uh, in in the last in the Smug Mug video, I went to this one the that one spot where I'm doing the day to night time lapse above the bridge and above the city, and I tried going. I've tried to get fog at that spot, and it, I think it took me five or six tries to get fog at that spot with the time lapse. And it's what I actually just put out. It was like my last YouTube video is talking about persistence and patience when it comes to landscape photography and time-lapse. I mean, those are two of the biggest keys to getting the shots that you want. 
Uh, and yeah, you're not going to get the shot unless you're there. You have to be there to get the shot. So that's, you know, definitely yeah. a huge element to it. Yeah, it's interesting because almost everybody would have, the day we made the Smug Mug film, everybody in San Francisco probably thought it was a beautiful day, but you were disappointed that there was no fog. <laughs> It was very clear. Yeah. It would have been nice to get a few clouds in the sky or some fog, but um, yeah, no, I just went, kept going back to that same spot yeah. over and over again, and I didn't get what I wanted for another, yeah, another five, five or six trips, hmm. and then I finally got what I wanted. <laughs> Listen, we've got so. lots of great questions coming in, but before I get to some more of the questions and, and talk to you a bit more about your craft. Um, are you cool if I play the the Liberty time lapse, the New York one? Yeah, sure. I'll play that. Um, hopefully, it comes across okay. It's always it's always kind of difficult streaming uh, videos, uh, but uh, let's see if we can uh, cue this up. Um, hopefully, hopefully that comes across okay. How's it looking? Uh, nice. <laughs> of course. Nice. Is the audio playing on their end? How many uh, people do we have in the stream? Wow! It's a decent amount. Yeah, for music, I'll, I'll just recommend people go to the music bed. Use my link, promo code Shane Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It gives the... People get a free trial for that week. Uh, and then I think after that, it's like 10 bucks a month to just use music for YouTube and things. Apologies if our, mic, uh, our mics were open during that. Uh, <laughs> a few folks in the, they heard us chatting. So, so sorry for that. Hope it didn't disturb your viewing pleasure. Um, <laughs> that is, you know, just a small example of the incredible time lapses that um, that you are capable of doing. Um, I'm conscious in that, especially at New York, where a lot, a lot of your time lapses, I see it is a step beyond that stagnant time lapse on mm -hmm. um just a tripod there's a lot of movement in the time lapse your camera is going like past trees it's going through like handrails how do you take it from a stagnant time lapse to that 
kind of next level. Yeah, so I do like shooting static time lapses. I do shoot them quite a bit, but um, for this video specifically, I used a lot of motion control equipment. So I used um, two two pan and tilt heads. There was the, the Motomo Spectrum pan and tilt head, which is uh, used to pan the camera to the right and left, and then also tilt down and up. And then um, I used the Dynamic Perception Stage uh, Zero slider system. And that's what's allowing the camera to actually move on a track throughout the scene. And what I love about using this type of equipment in a place like New York City is it really shows it really shows the landscape in more of a 3D space, whereas with a static shot, oftentimes that, well, it feels kind of static. It feels more like an image than it does, you know, a place that you can actually walk through. Um, so I do love the effect of moving throughout the city because it kind of allows you to feel like you're moving through the city. So um, I tried to do as many of those shots as possible for this time-lapse film. And yeah, there's a number of different sliders out there. There's some cheaper ones that um, that have come out since. Like, there's some pretty small, cheap sliders I think you can get on Amazon. But uh, these ones are what I use for work. I just know they, I know they're rock solid, and I can break it down for travel. And so when I'm asked to do commercial shoots and do these motion controlled time lapses, uh, I bring the dynamic perception and then the Modimo with me usually. Cool. I think do you? I think you may have an image. Uh, lined up that kind of showcases that setup yeah See if we yeah can let me up. let me pull that up real quick so let me go to share screen because slider is just one part of it where you can slide the camera but you need some way of automating um it to move in the, at the correct speed in the manner that you want right yeah, we didn't have this is just a screenshot from like a time lapse course trailer that I yeah. have, but uh, this shows the whole setup. Um, so you can see here, I've got the Nikon D850 wide lens, and the the slider is moving um, from the ground up, and it's going to reveal more of these cracks and more of the landscape. And as I'm also moving up, the camera is tilting on this tracked head uh, you can see it's plugged in by battery power i control it from an app on my phone and as the sun was rising i was capturing these mountains catching the light with the cracks in the foreground and it just added it just added another layer um to the time lapse and um, motion is just so interesting to watch because you know you the camera on this track is moving so slowly it clicks an image, moves, clicks another image, moves, and it'll do this for about 30 minutes to an hour, but once you play back the time lapse, it looks like the camera's moving in real time at real speed. So the camera's moving up the slider. Sorry, just mm -hmm. keep, keep uh, oh, focus on that. So the camera's moving up the slider, but you said it's also tilting. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you know how much to tilt it, how, how to make it, or do you just give it a start and an end point and let the the software do it how, how does that yes. work i create a start point and then an end point and then it will keyframe everything in between so it'll know the smooth transition between the two points and really as far as like how much to tilt how much to pan it all comes down to personal preference and what your creativity tells you would work best for that scene um for me I, I found this to be the most, I found these cracks to be so interesting. And I thought, well, what would make for an intriguing shot is if we start out low where the cracks are very close to the camera and as we pan up, or sorry, not as we pan up, but as the camera moves up and as the camera tilts, you reveal that more of these cracks exist and you can show the patterns of them with the mountains in the background. So that is personally the move that I found the most interesting for this specific shot. But if I was any, if I was somewhere else, I may have picked something completely different. Like in the city, most of my shots were more left to right pan moves. And the reason I did that is because we're not for, for stuff like this, we're not really, or for, for walking around the city. Like if I wanted to show uh, New York City and make it feel like the person is walking through the city. Most of the time when you're walking through a city, you're not like moving from the ground up. 
<laughs> so I actually chose to do more um, like panning shots for that film. Whereas in nature, I, I had a, I, I had a little bit more of um, I was doing a little bit more creative moves, like more actual um, tilts and more rising shots. Yeah. So a, a couple of questions that you're mm -hmm. showing there. No, keep on that. Keep on that. Image. Oh, sorry. It's all about the gear. <laughs> the um, so you've got a power pack there. Yeah. Which is is that powering the camera and the the motor or is it just the motor? That just powers the motor. Okay. And then the camera itself just has a regular camera battery in it. Right. I guess um, one of the benefits of sticking with a larger DSLR rather than mirrorless is they tend to have bigger batteries in them, right? And mm -hmm. have a bit more a bit more power. I know um, some of the mirrorless ones the, the batteries are so small that they don't last too long. Yeah. Um, the older Sony cameras that I used to use have terrible battery life. And any time I would do a time lapse, I would bring a battery grip with me. And that worked out really great. Um, but yeah, as far as, uh, as far as the bigger DSLRs or any of the new mirrorless that are coming out, they have pretty good battery life. So I've been able to do Astro shots on only one Nikon battery or, um, you know, one of the newer Sony batteries. So yeah, battery life isn't too much of an issue. It, it used to be a bigger issue with the older cameras, I think. Right. Good to know. Good to know. Um, the things are improving in that, that sense all the time. Um, we, people may have heard us talking during the, during that video, unfortunately. So we were talking mm -hmm. about music. Uh, it's something mm -hmm. we wanted to, to discuss. How, because we had some questions come in about how long do you spend coming up with music? Does the music music come first? Does it come during? How does, how does music and time lapse, how does that all go together? Um, yeah, music is pretty important for, I mean, really any video, um, but sp specifically time lapse is pretty important. So that's probably the thing I spend the most time doing is searching for music. In the New York video, my friend James composed that song, so I licensed directly from him. For a lot of my work, um, I'll use stock music websites like the Music Bed which we were talking about over the video, that's the one that I use the most for all of my new vlogs. And um, yeah, pretty most of the new videos I put out is the music bed, but I've used some of the others. There's like subscription services. So you pay like 10 bucks a month and then you get access to music for YouTube and for online. So there's also Artlist and uh, Soundstripe, Epidemic Sound. Personally, I use the music bed just because I found the music to be... I don't know, the highest quality and what works for my videos and, and the mood that I'm going for. But yeah, they're most most of the subscription services are pretty good. Yeah, and we will put the, the link to uh, Musicbed uh, in your, in the description of these show notes once we're done. Uh, I'm glad that you said you had uh, licensed the the New York one from a friend because then hopefully we won't get take, it won't get taken down on <laughs> No, no. YouTube. That's cool. No, yeah, uh, it, that's a that's a big tip too. Don't. It's not a good idea to use copyrighted music without no. either a license agreement, permission, or you. That's that's why I found these these stock websites so easy to use. They used to be harder, and it used to be a lot more expensive to license music through stock websites. But I think since you know doing YouTube videos has become so popular these websites started the subscription based services and yeah. um, it's made it a lot easier. Like I can, you know, just subscribe to something for 10 bucks a month and then I can download like 200 songs in a week, which is crazy yeah. because before um, using that same service, I had licensed some music and each time I licensed the song, it was 60 bucks a song. Yeah, so if I put difference. like, yeah, it's crazy. But anyways, yeah, just don't, you know, if you're using me, copyrighted music you get a chance that your video gets taken down or yeah. if you're using it anywhere commercially that that gets into big legal issues so yeah. you know. uh, and just just from experience you know, i'm streaming at least twice a week uh, here with uh, you know we, we're releasing smug mug films uh, all of which is licensed and, and approved and we still get a strike on almost every video we put up uh, youtube uh, and and so many online services now are using 
bots, you know, AI, artificial intelligence to to check all the videos. It's not it's not humans that are watching every video. They just couldn't possibly do it because there's so much content being created. So the the bots that go through your your films, they will almost instantly find a piece of music and they will know if it's if it's even allowed to be licensed and you'll get strikes very quickly. And as I see, we get strikes for stuff that we have licenses for. And it takes a lot of time to to kind of complain and argue against the strikes you get on YouTube. You know, it's not the simplest yeah. thing to do. It takes a lot of time. So make sure you're doing it appropriately. Right, let's go back to some questions. Um, there was quite a few come in, so I'm going to scroll back a little bit here. Um, this, this is a fun question. It's, it's one I, I've, uh, I've kind of witnessed, Gary. So uh, Gary Monroe asks, how much hovering do you do <laughs> when you're shooting? Are you constantly checking it or do you just go and read a book or wait? Uh, I, I can answer that. Typically, he just eats. <laughs> That's true. Um, I think it depends on the shot and how confident I am that the shot is going to work. Like, if I'm very confident that it's going to work, I'll go and do something else. But every once in a while, especially when you're setting up a shot and you're troubleshooting the gear and something is kind of not working right, which to be honest, it doesn't matter what gear you use. There are going to be times where you're using it and something just isn't working right, especially when you're setting up and you're getting frustrated and it still happens to me all the time. Um, if that's the case and then I finally get it to work, I'm a lot more nervous about the shot. So I just kind of like observe, make sure everything's working, make sure the interval isn't skipping or the battery's working or the camera isn't, you know, messing up for some reason. But yeah, if I know my gear is working and it, the setup is pretty smooth, then I'll just go do something else usually. And I, most of the time, like for this Mug Mug film, I think we waited an hour and a half or two hours for that time lapse to finish. And most of the time spent was just sitting and watching the landscape because if you're if you're shooting a time lapse of something generally what you're shooting is probably pretty interesting visually so i just like watching it usually just observing the landscape watching like for that one we were watching the boats cruise around and the lighting changing on the buildings and the planes leaving sfo so it was cool yeah and another good reason a reason for hovering around it, it's it's also depends where you are the safety of your equipment it's it's you know it's worth hovering around just to make sure it's uh still there when you need it yeah for the new york time for the new york time lapses i was just like on the gear because not only i mean i didn't think anyone was going to steal the gear like it'd be easy to steal a camera on a tripod but once you put a camera on a six foot slider it's going to be very hard for somebody to just run and grab that. Like, I feel like somebody who would steal a camera is going to look at that and not even fully know what it is at first. So it's not really something somebody could run and grab. But what I was more worried about with something like the New York time lapse or any of the ones that I shoot in busy cities is people knocking the tripods. So I actually stand pretty close to the slider and tripods just to make sure people are aware that it's there because people like to walk while looking at their phones and they'll like run into things right you know i'm sure you've been walking and then somebody almost runs into you because they were texting um that happens a lot when you're shooting time lapse so yeah just i just checking like to be on the gear one simple bump in the whole the whole thing's ruined right typically you can yeah if depending on the bump if if the bump is small i can skip fix, the frame or something yeah i can skip the frame or i can kind of fix the adjustment a little bit but if it's too much yeah you could ruin the shot and have to redo it i've had to do that a bunch of times yeah right let's see uh a few questions came in i'm not sure if you're able to answer these but a few people including james has mentioned they're thinking of the new canon eos r5 there's a question about the r6 any thoughts i don't know if you've even shot with them <laughs> yeah to be honest with you um I'm not a big gear person. I've looked into the new Sony A7S uh, 3 because it looks like it's really fun for low light video. But as far as time lapses go, it's not very relevant. Like if I shot a time, if I shot a time lapse the right way with an old Canon 5D Mark II or an old Canon like 
you know, crop sensor body. And then I shot one with the brand new, you know, whatever just came out that's amazing. And I showed them to you side by side. Honestly, you wouldn't see a big difference when you're shooting the time lapses. Um, as long as you set up the shot right, you set up a composition that's interesting, you know, it, I still I still license and use shots in my videos that that I did back in like 2010 or 2011. Um, and no one knows that they think that they're new shots and they're like, what camera did you use? Did you use the Nikon D850 for this? And I was like, no, nah, this was with like an old crop body Canon and a kit lens, you know? Um, I don't think that's not to say gear doesn't matter for certain things, especially if you want the features of the camera. Like if you want a camera that shoots great in low light, the, you know, these, the Sony a seven S and stuff like that is going to be amazing. But, um, I've just found, you know, yeah, gear gear just doesn't matter yeah. quite as much as it what helps, you're trying to show. Yeah, it's not the be all end all, and they're just boxes with holes in them. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know much about the new Canon cameras. Uh, I'm I'm sure they're I'm sure they're great. You know, like any camera, any camera that's coming out now is is probably pretty great. I mean, they just keep getting better. Yeah, and all the cameras we currently have, ten years ago, we'd have thought, you know. It was science fiction. They were that good. So uh, yeah, don't get too bogged down. Here's a question I don't understand, but maybe you can in the time-lapse world. Lucas asks, do you use some kind of DSLR dashboard or other device for smoother time-lapsing? I think that may be a software uh, thing. Are you familiar with that? I am familiar. There are a ton of new... Um, yeah, there's, there's that, and then there's a ton of new devices, softwares, plugins for shooting mostly day to night time lapses. That's the goal. Um, personally, I do not. Um, I've used a bunch of different, what they're, they're called bulb rampers. They're external devices that allow you to shoot smooth day to night time lapses. Um, personally, I just set my camera to aperture priority mode and get the settings all correct on my Sony um, or on the Nikon. The Nikon does a worse job than the Sony does. I get more what's called flicker. So when you have inconsistencies in between exposures, um, you can see a little bit of flicker in the shot. It looks like a strobing effect. Um, I get a little bit more with the Nikon, but I use a program called LR Time Lapse. Um, which I'm sure some of the people are familiar with in the chat, but it allows me to deflicker the shot in post and get it perfectly smooth. And um, I think yeah, you read, I, I think been... you read the next question because John oh, from really? Adrenal says, "Question: What causes the flicker in some time lapses, and how do you stop it?" Well, so... I'll answer that a little bit more too. Right. But as far as uh, yeah, LR time lapse, like I've used that program since I think 2011. And I would use it with my old Canon cameras. And the Canon cameras had terrible flicker when you were doing day to night shots because the light meter in the camera just wasn't as advanced as what's coming out now. So you'd see a lot more of those inconsistencies. And um, yeah, I mean, even back then, I could take a really flickery shot and get it perfect with LR time lapse with some pretty simple controls. And now, even LR time lapse, it has more modes and settings and uh, multiple pass de flicker that you can do to smooth out the shot. So I just haven't found it to be an issue uh, to smooth out the time lapses anymore. So I just run the Nikon on aperture priority mo mode or the Sony's, which have even better light meters. Like I've shot some day to night time lapses on the Sony's where they didn't actually require any de flickering at all, which is crazy. So um, no, I haven't found a use for really many bulb rampers or external you know, plugins for the day to night stuff. I just do it aperture priority mode. It's kind of like when you know something works, you just stick with that because if I'm shooting a commercial shot for a client, I need to know that that shot is going to work. I don't have the luxury of like really messing it up and doing it again. Um, so I just don't really trust. I'm sure that some of these plugins and bulb rampers work great, but I've just found that over the years, aperture priority mode is the thing that has worked the best for me. So that's, that's what I tend to do. Um, flicker. So yeah, flicker can be caused by inconsistencies and exposure changes. It can also be caused, um, this is more of an issue with older cameras, but, uh, it's called aperture fluctuation. 
Okay. So like a lens, when, um, when you're taking a picture and the lens is connected to the camera, there's tiny little inconsistencies in the aperture blades. They'll move ever so slightly okay. when the camera is clicking. And it's not noticeable when you're taking pictures. Like if you take a picture and you put the settings in, you're not going to notice the difference if you are scrolling between your still images. But if you play back those still images at 24 frames per second, depending on what your aperture is and um, what camera you're using, you can see minor inconsistencies. So with the older cameras that I used to use, like the older Sonys and the older Canon cameras, I used to actually disconnect the lens from the camera before shooting the time lapse. I would get the um, aperture and then I would press, I think it's like the aperture preview button, and then I would disconnect the lens and then start shooting the when time lapse. When you say disconnect, too. like just just turn as if you're about to take it off, but ever, yep. but ever so slightly. So, so is, the it, is it more to do with more to do with the lens than the body, or which? Uh, I'm. It's more. It's more to do with the way the lens is reacting to the body. Right. Probably. Um, I have noticed that. To be honest with you, I don't really get the aperture fluctuations on any new cameras that I've used. Like I don't. I don't disconnect the lenses on the Nikon anymore. I don't find it useful. But with the Canon cameras, I remember specifically back when I used to use the 6D all the time, I would always disconnect the lens because I got I got so many of those fluctuations. Um, two other things that can cause flicker are, um, well, th three things. I'll answer them quickly. So one of them is using a super high shutter speed for time lapse. Um, that can cause a little bit of visual flicker. So if you knock down that shutter speed, um, you know, if you're shooting like one one thousandth, thousandth of a second, you can see a little bit of flicker uh, in some shots, depending on how the lighting is changing and what's happening in the frame. Um, and also just in general, the nature of what you're shooting can cause flicker. So let's say you're shooting clouds moving and you choose an interval that's like five seconds and the lighting is changing so rapidly what it, it could just be v the visual lighting changes that look like flicker in your shot um and a lot of that is just coming down to what shutter speed you decide to do if you do a long exposure if you're shooting things that are moving quickly um shoot a, a quicker interval to avoid getting those fast uh, lighting changes and then the very last thing with Flickr I'll, I'll say is you can actually create Flickr that wasn't in the shot by doing too much post-processing to your shots. I found that using too much clarity, things like the dehaze slider, um, too much shadow recovery and highlight recovery can cause a little bit of flicker and inconsistencies in between frames. So you just need to be careful when you're post-processing your shots not to actually create flicker that wasn't actually there in the shots um sure. yeah and obviously i have to point out that bad flicker has nothing to do with flicker.com of course <laughs> it's like we're plugging flicker constantly there um, yeah but yeah the bad kind we're the good kind uh question from uh sushit who joins us uh where did sushit said he was joining us from india i think he said um and it's like gone midnight there so thank you man he's like do you have a preference uh, if you on whether you would stack nds or do you try and do that with a single nd mm, i've stacked nds before um usually with decent results like i've stacked a six stop and a ten stop um i found that with the screw-on filters I get more vignetting and sometimes color casts than I have with like, like I use a square filter set right now, like the Polar Pro Summit one. Um, and I've stacked filters and not had any issues or any sort of like vignetting on it. But no, I don't really have a problem stacking filters. I, I don't do it often though. I don't find myself needing to do it. Like I have a 10 stop filter works great during the day. I have a six stop filter works great for sunset, sunrise, twilight, and uh, and then I have my CPL. So, yeah, I haven't found the need to stack all three <laughs> for a shot, but you could if you wanted to. Um, yeah, I, 
I guess it, it, you know, that would come down to what filters you're using. If you're using certain filters that are creating more color casts or that have inconsistencies, you're going to really see the drop in quality if you start stacking them. But um, kind of like with the new cameras coming out, most of the new filters coming out by different companies are pretty good because they're all competing with each other. So I haven't found, like I've, I've tested out all the new filter companies that have come out recently, like... You know, you got your case filters, your Nissi, your Haida, your, you know, you got Polar Pro, Breakthrough. I mean, they're all pretty good. Like, I haven't found any of them to be poor quality. I'm sure poor quality filters exist, but if you're, you know, looking at reviews and whatnot, most of them are pretty good. Yeah. None of them are 100% perfect, so don't expect you're going to get zero color cast, but we're pretty close nowadays. Most of them are way better than anything we had many years ago um oh going, yeah 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 going back to the the new york city time lapse that we just played um patrick asked the question how long were you in new york city to get that time lapse i spent there were three trips that i did that film uh for the first trip was two weeks in 2016 and then yeah two weeks in 2016 then I went back in 2017 for two weeks, and then I went back for one week in 2018. So five weeks total and uh, three trips over. Yeah, like it, it took three years. Wait, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, it took like three years to finally release that video after I started it. So a lot of commitment. It's definitely not yeah. easy, but it it shows <laughs> in the quality of that in that video. You you're not going to make something like that in one weekend in New York. For that's for sure. Um, another question here from Soam. Thanks Soam for your question. When on location and you get awesome conditions, I usually get excited and miss getting the perfect shot. How do you avoid this? Focus. <laughs> yeah, I've done that before. Absolutely. Um, I've been there. B. I, I think my best advice for that is to be at the location before the exciting stuff happens. Like immerse yourself in the landscape, scout what you want, and enjoy the landscape before the good light that you want to shoot comes. And I know that's hard. Sometimes you're rushing out the door and you're like, oh my God, the clouds are amazing and I need to go rush to a spot to go shoot. But um, yeah, I, I like to just spend, if I, if I want to go photograph sunset, I will leave and go somewhere like two or three hours early at least and just hang out, just enjoy, go hike around, scout. And I usually scout what I want and know what I want to shoot before the good light is happening. Like I'll, I'll have it in my head. Okay. And I'll find different compositions that are in different um, positions too. So, you know, I'll look over here and say, okay, well there's a composition that works great. If the lighting is, is great um, facing away from the sun. Or, okay, I found a composition that I'd like to shoot if the clouds blow up, you know, facing the sun. And I'll have a few different ideas in my head of what I want, and then I'll just hang out. And if you're hanging out and you're getting used to the landscape, you'll enjoy the amazing conditions if they happen, right? You'll be like, oh my gosh, the amazing conditions. But you will have, you will have set out a good plan for yourself to go capture it. Like, you'll know what you want to shoot. So rather than trying to think of what you want to shoot and be amazed by the clouds, you can just go shoot what you want and enjoy the sunset rather than being flustered, which, you know, I, I know it's hard, though. Like, that's easier said than done because sometimes you're just rushing. Sometimes the lighting changes in unexpected ways. So some of it is just adaptability, but uh, plan for the success and you'll have a better time getting the shot, I would say. Yeah. There's some great comments uh, coming in on the discussion. Uh, Michael says it's good call. Gear is definitely less important than skills, that's for sure. Um, uh, Lucas was thanking us for an answer to the question. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks for all the questions. Yeah, Sushit says thank you for the answer on the ND stacking. Uh, it was very helpful. Uh, cool. And talking about the, the weeks in New York, Patrick, who asked how long it took, said it appeared to be a lot of work. Thank you. Uh, for sure. <laughs> it was a little bit. <laughs> I am going to play, there's still some questions and I will get to them. And if you have questions, keep keep posting them and I'll get to them. But I'm going to play 
the time lapse that we took uh, while we were uh, with you in uh, the headlands uh, above the the Golden Gate Bridge, which uh, is the the dated night time lapse, and then there's there's a, a second one that plays just after it. Hopefully, this might spur some questions in your head if you're watching them. Uh, so yeah, watch this and then post some more questions and we'll, we'll get to the questions that are there. Hopefully this plays and we promise we won't talk all the way over this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's... No promise. World move. night tonight so we'll finish that there and people can watch the rest of that film uh at their leisure it doesn't it doesn't stream quite as as smooth as if you're watching it uh yourself so go check it out here on the smuggling live youtube channel uh the first one there we saw two little clips there the first one was you know that very impressive day to night which for a lot of people is the kind of holy grail of uh of, of time-lapse photography what um what added complication does moving throughout a day when the lighting change changes so dramatically, what added complications does that add and how do you solve them? I know you've mentioned already that you kind of stick it in aperture priority mode, but can you speak a little bit more about the process when it's day to night? Yeah, for sure. So um, what was easy about that shot and what I enjoyed more about that shot, or so for a day to night, there's a few different things to consider, um, and especially for my technique of aperture priority mode. For aperture priority mode, um, it it's best to find scenes where there aren't huge consistency changes of lighting. Like, for example, here's a good good example. So for the New York time lapse, I was shooting a lot in Times Square. There's tons of giant screens just flashing all the time, right? Um, if I tried to do a day to night, like an after priority mode shot in um, Times Square, actually, I should have tried this just to see if it would work. But um, there's so much lighting changes that I think this, the camera's uh, lighting meter would have a really confusing time trying to understand how to expose the image. So you would get crazy differences of exposures depending on which LED lights are on, how many taxis fly by the camera. Um, so I found for day to night shots, what works best is being away from flickering lights. Like you can have lights that kind of flicker in the distance, but nothing that's just moving right past the camera. Because if you have, let's say you have a truck that passes right by the camera and you have aperture priority mode on, as that truck is passing, the camera is going to be like, oh my gosh, it got so much darker. Let's overexpose the scene. Um, and then it'll go back to normal once the truck passes. But so, so I found vantage points like that, high up vantage points above cities work really great. Um, when I'm in nature, it doesn't matter as much. There's less moving in nature. So, um, you know, you can set up an aperture, aperture priority mode around mountains and, and get great results. Um, I've also found that the more dynamic range in the scene. So right now for that shot or for that shot, I was fo facing mostly away from the sun. Um, probably like what, 75 degrees, 80 degrees from the, s no, I think a little further than that from the sun. Um, and what's nice is I have all that dynamic range and the spot meter doesn't have to kind of, uh, guess what the exposure should be because I'm sure if you've faced your camera towards the sun and you have it on aperture priority mode, you realize depending on where you aim the camera, it'll completely change the exposure. If you aim towards the ground facing into the sun, it'll completely blow out the sky. And then if you focus in the sky, it'll completely silhouette the uh, foreground. So I've found the day to night shots do work the best when you're facing away from the sun, um, just as far as getting more consistent frames. And I do like the, I think the lighting is easier to control as well. So I, I do more shots facing away from the sun that are day to nights. And if I am facing into the sun for a shot, I'll do those on manual instead so I can control what's happening. 
um, like a shot in Times Square. Let's say I wanted to do a day to night shot in Times Square with all the LED lights. To be honest with you, what I might try doing is two shots, one during the day with manual settings, let the light go down to twilight and then take another shot. And then I would probably blend the two. I think that that's probably what I would do if if I if somebody asked me to do a day to night shot in Times Square I would probably set up that shot and then I would do one on aperture priority mode and and like do two cameras because that's such a weird shot to do with so many inconsistencies um yeah day to night there there's definitely there's definitely variables that can happen like sometimes the shot depending on your light meter can just kind of mess up <laughs> it does happen every once in a while but you know, usually, usually it's correct. It can be corrected in post if you put in some time and, and work and, you know, use the deflickering software. Too. Yeah. There was, there was lots of questions there that came in. I think you answered quite a lot of them, you know, uh, people were asking about, uh, how you, how you prevent flicker. Flicker seems to be flicker with an E seems to be, um, a big question and something people seem to be, uh, judging by the question, seem to be experiencing a lot of problems when they've tried their own type time lapses and stuff. Uh, but one, yeah. one that you maybe mentioned when you were talking about shooting away from the sun, uh, John was asking uh, if you use a circular polarizer, do you have to adjust it throughout the day? If I'm using, if I'm going to shoot a day to night time lapse, I do not polarize the lens. Right. Because, um, especially when it gets dark, I just don't want to deal with that. Losing a stop. You know, move, uh, that, that, uh, darkening uh, of the frame. So yeah, um, for day to night shots, I will not use a polarizer, but if I'm shooting manual and I'm doing like a 15 minute, 30 minute time lapse, I, I will use a polarizer and you know, I can, I can control the shutter speed a little bit easier with manual shots too. So, um, one thing to consider is doing day to night shots where you're really close to water the water is going to start out looking really choppy if you do aperture priority mode so um, if i'm shooting on the water i'll try to be not right next to it i'll try and be like a little higher from from like a river or a lake or something so that that so that the choppiness of the water isn't as noticeable because the closer you are, the more choppy it's going to look. So totally cool. If you're shooting a manual shot, you can throw on an ND filter, smooth out the water, get amazing results. But if you're doing a day to night shot and those shutter speeds, you're going to st start out pretty quick. Um, that water is going to look not so great. Yeah. The closer you are. Yeah. John Adrenal follow back up. He says, uh, okay, so yeah, I burnt out a sensor doing photos into the sun. If you wanted to do a transit of the sun, how would you go about not burning out a sensor? Interesting. Um, hmm. I guess that's why he was using CPLs and, and uh, NDs and stuff. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I've never burnt out a sun. To be honest. I've shot into the sun a few times for, you know, I've shot, I've shot time lapses of the sun going down. Um, but not, usually not followed if, the sun consistently across the sky. No, no. If you're shooting, yeah, if you're just sticking a telephoto lens into the sun, that's probably not great for the sensor, especially if the sun is high up in the sky. Um, any of my sunball shots, like the sunball going behind buildings or behind a mountain or, you know, they're shoot, shot with a telephoto lens, they're usually done at sunset and sunrise. And the the sun's intensity is not high enough to burn out a sensor at those times. But, you know, if you're shooting like like obviously the biggest one would be like shooting a solar eclipse and things like that then yeah you want to use like heavy heavy nd filters and um i think i can't remember what we used for like this the the eclipse it was like some crazy crazy nd that was like six, 18 stops or something like that but yeah. it's so rare that i would do a midday sunshot like that. Um, and, and it's not really a big deal if you're using a wide lens. Like if you're pointing, if you're using a 14 millimeter lens and the sun is high in the sky and it's hitting the sensor, it's, yeah, it's really when you go to those telephoto lengths and you're like 400 mil on the shot or yeah. on the sun that I can see it being a huge issue for so sure. Everybody can learn from 
John's lesson, as he says here, expensive, expensive mistake. <laughs> Um, let's see what else we've got here. Um, scrolling back up, uh, Sushit wanted to know a little bit more about uh, some of your process. You mentioned uh, that you used fixed apertures. Do you also lock focus to infinity point of interest? What's what kind of what's the kind of process that goes through your head procedure when you using auto white balance or you using manual white balance? All those kind of things. Yeah, I always shoot manual white balance, but I'm shooting everything raw, so it really doesn't matter. Like the white balance doesn't really matter because it's just going to reset in in post. Um, but I pick a consistent white balance because it's easier to review my footage in the camera. Usually I just keep everything on daylight for time lapse. It's just easy. It makes it simple. Um, for focus? Focus and point, yeah. Yeah, for focus, it depends on the shot. If it's a if it's a vantage point and everything is out in infinity, I'll select infinity. Um, it what's really the biggest thing for focus is is what is the most important thing in your shot. What are you trying to show? If you're trying to show the city in the background, and you've got like some grass and leaves in the foreground that you're maybe moving past, but you focus on the grass and leaves and the city in the background is blurry, probably not the right choice, right? But if the whole point of the shot was to show the grass, like maybe there was something in the grass that was going to make the shot, right? Like yeah. maybe there's a fox in the grass and he's just sitting there hanging out. Then you probably want to sh focus, focus on the fox. On so I, I, I decide what is the most important thing to be in focus in the shot. Um, most of the time, though, a lot of the times of time lapse, I will focus on infinity because usually whatever is in the background of a time lapse, like if it's a skyline in the background or the sun setting with beautiful clouds and some mountain peaks, that's usually the thing that I want people to really focus on. Um, yeah, it, it, there are cases where I'll focus on the foreground. Like if I'm panning around a little flower and that's mm. the main central focus, I'll focus on that and just have the background be out of focus. But, um, yeah, it's okay. it's just determine what's the most important thing in your shot. Yeah, what you're trying and focus to focus on that, I would say. Every episode, I try and think of a, a cool show title that's mentioned, and I think today's show title is "You Want to Focus on the Fox." There you go. That's <laughs> cool title. <laughs> um, let's see what else we've got. James asks, uh, "What about using auto ISO? Do you ever is that a good idea? Is it something you try?" Uh, yeah, I've used auto ISO on the Sony's and. Um, I've gotten mostly good results by using it. Uh, I think there was one or two shots where I did get more flicker by using it, but I'm not sure if that was because of auto ISO or just the nature of what I was shooting. Um, yeah, I've used auto ISO before. I'll like start out at ISO 100 and let it go to like, I don't know, ISO 800. Basically what happens with auto ISO is it's going to change your ISO before it decides to change your shutter speed. So if you're not sure how dark the frame is going to get, like maybe you're shooting and it's, you think it's going to get really dark and you want to bump that ISO up, um, you can do, you can start out at like ISO 100. The shot will start as it, as that lighting fades, it's going to start changing the ISO. And then once it hits your max ISO, like ISO 800, then it'll start changing the shutter speed. So um, yeah, in a, in a case where I saw, I, I said, wow, it's going to get really dark where I'm shooting. Like there's no bright lights around me. Um, I will do the auto ISO so that I can get more of that exposure so that by the time it gets dark, I'm not shooting crazy long shutter speeds. That's the one thing is you want to make sure that when you're doing your day to night shots, if you set an interval, like let's say you want an image to click every seven seconds for an hour and a half. But then as the lighting changes and it gets dark, you realize, oh, your shutter speed is, it wants to go to 15 seconds or 20 seconds. Well, now you're going to get a lot less frames when it gets dark. And that can be um, more jarring to look at because people will notice, oh, it got a lot faster when it got dark. So um, to battle that, you do want to consider your ISO and your aperture. So usually when I'm shooting the day to night shots, I'll have my aperture pretty wide so that I'm letting more light into the camera. And then I will sh uh, either bump the ISO up to start the shot or I'll do auto ISO so that that ISO starts coming in as it gets dark and then the shutter speed starts rolling. 
yeah. if that all makes sense, hopefully. Great, great info. Man, the questions are keep coming. Are you okay for time, Michael? Yeah. Yeah, cool. The uh, Akash asks, uh, was there ever a situation where you were forced to bracket images and then create a time lapse out of those? If yeah, yes, was it worth that. the effort? I've had to do that for clients before. We were doing like, I've done time lapses where um, we actually had to do HDR time lapse. So I would shoot three frames, three uh, exposures for each frame. And then I had to blend them all and use a like an HDR software. Um, I don't think it's worth it. I wouldn't do it for myself. That is not worth the time, the data. Like it already for an 8K time lapse is like what 40, 50 gigs for one time lapse. I can't imagine shooting one time lapse and having like 150 gigs just for the raw files. Um, personally, yeah, I don't think it's worth it with how good cameras are getting now. Like the dynamic range in most cameras, I can shoot most of my time lapses and get any sort of shadow detail and any sort of highlight detail that I want. And you know and you know what? Like if I'm facing into the sun, it's okay if the sun is a tiny bit blown out if you're facing into it. Um so I'm okay with that. Um I I personally don't think it's worth it. But yeah, I have had to do that for clients before, especially with older cameras. Like I think when I was doing the HDR time lapses for a few clients it was with a Canon 60, so the dynamic range was not as good. And facing into the sun, you actually did need multiple exposures to do a, a properly exposed time lapse. But the amount of work you're going to spend in post, it's not, it's, it's ridiculous. And then the other thing to consider is if you want to do HDR time lapse, you have to wait for all three frames to finish shooting before the next image in the sequence can click if that yeah. makes sense so if you have your set interval and you want to do quick intervals like let's say something's moving quickly and you want to shoot two second intervals getting three frames that are at different exposures especially if they're slight long exposures that's not really going to work for um shooting most intervals so yeah i i don't think it's worth it but you know it's worth a try like if you have the time and you can play around with it it's it's worth a try but you that's just a ton of work yeah. talking of uh lots of uh, effort and uh production and post-production uh, are you cool if i play wormhole oh yeah I, at first you're, i'm like what is wormhole and i was like oh yeah that's a your, video i made i your forgot video about that called wormhole <laughs> you cool yeah if i forgot play? about that because this this to me is where you can take you've taken time lapse to a whole other planet with with something like like wormhole um and it's just to let people see that there's a whole other should i say dimension that you can use when uh playing time lapse if you want to see this at super high quality i believe it's probably yeah it's in 4k so if you want to see this head over to to michael's uh youtube channel which is in the show notes and, and watch this i suggest you watch this with a great set of headphones on a large, <laughs> large screen, uh, four K monitor, and in coy. So we'll we'll sit back and let this play for the next three minutes, and then we'll we'll wrap up with a few final questions.
epic. Well, that's all I can say. It's absolutely phenomenal. You must be Thanks. so proud of that one. Oh, sorry, the voice cut out for a second. Oh, I'm saying you must be so proud of that one. It's it's a great, great piece. Yeah. That was a super fun one to create. Um, that was like a sequel, kind of sequel-ish to another video I made in 2013 called Mirror City. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I was just having a lot of fun with kaleidoscopic imagery. And um, really what I loved so much about that technique is taking really familiar landscapes, really familiar objects, familiar buildings and architecture and kind of just, um, I was going to say simplifying it, but really <laughs> it's, it's um, you know, creating this symmetry out of it and these kaleidoscopic colors and shapes and taking all these familiar landscapes and just um, creating almost like abstract art out of it. And uh, it was just a lot of fun. That, those were two of my favorite videos to create. Yeah, a lot of a lot of love uh, for that uh, in the comments. People think it's absolutely incredible. In, thank you, it thank is, you. It Appreciate is, that. It is stunning. I mean, I struggle with uh, a basic time lapse, so you know, looking at that type of thing. Uh, and as I say, you know, please go watch it in 4K or super high def if you can, which you're not going to get on a stream like this. But um, it's quite 4K quite TV. Incredible. 4K <laughs> TV. Yeah, unfortunately, streaming it. You know, I'm streaming at I think 1080. It's it's hard enough to stream at standard high def, let alone super high def. Standard high def is yeah. that a thing? Uh, standard high def. Standard that high seems def. like it's a contradiction. <laughs> Do you remember standard definition? Um, <laughs> let's finish up with a with a few questions. Um, there was a question about your uh, master class. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it was a way back. Someone was asking, yeah, is all is all this stuff? covered in your master class yep um yeah that that master class took we started i started that when was it 2017 it took like three years to make that thing and it's basically just it's all sorts of start to finish time lapse time lapses so it's like any of my um, city day to night shots i'm showing all the techniques in field and then i go into post and show how to correct the shots and then uh it, it's anywhere from like the ba most basic time lapse like just shooting you know clouds with a camera and a tripod all the way to like motion controlled time lapses shielded from the wind revealing off of rocks uh and and day to night shots both in nature in the city um yeah i think it's like i think that whole course is like 12 hours long not that anyone has to watch, not that anyone has to watch twelve hours of me talking about stuff, but uh, yeah, it's a lot. That that I'm covers sure pretty much all my techniques. I'm sure there's a lot of people that will uh, want to do that. Um, if stay tuned and, and watch the the uh, show notes here, because uh, I may be able to add a a discount to that workshop uh, for a short time. So. Uh, I will try and get that in the show notes as soon as possible. It's, it's, I have actually watched most of the 12 hours. I'm still not all the way through it. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we had, had lots of time, you know, we're, we're not traveling quite as much as we used to. So um, I yeah. thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it and oh, have put, put a few of the techniques uh, to, I wouldn't say good use, I put them to use. Uh, the results were not great. Um, but uh, the big fail I had was I, I tried to do a time lapse um, on a, a harbor wall with the, 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 the water, the, the tide coming in and out uh, at mm. a, a beautiful harbor wall. And the entire thing was ruined with uh, water spray on the lens, uh, which was a complete wow. disaster. <laughs> yeah, water spray can be an issue. Um, quick tip for that is using uh, one of those rocket blowers, you know, mm -hmm. the the little rocket blowers and go from the side of the lens. So let's say, let's say the mic is the lens, just use the rocket blower from the side so that you're not in the shot, but you can get the water droplets off and then also use as wide of an aperture as possible so that those water droplets are less noticeable. I've actually shot like waterfalls before long exposures of waterfalls mm -hmm. uh, through time lapse, And, it, and I've looked at the lens and it just gets, all this water spray but i've been able to get pretty clean time lapses even though there's just constantly water hitting the camera so yeah those yeah. are two things you can do for that 
I had quite a quite a a, a large exposure um, or small exposure to get good depth of field on this shot, and yeah. coincided with a very typical Scottish rain, which uh, comes sideways in Scotland. So it was <laughs> impossible to uh, to keep it uh, to keep it um, dry. But it was a good a good yeah. experiment. Um, uh, a question came in. Um, about or a statement, the render time must have been days. You're just talking about wormhole. Mm -hmm. Pretty much all your work is a real big inspiration. Thank you, Bud, from Mali. Hey, thanks so much. Um, Appreciate that. Does it take a lot of time to render these things out, especially something Sometimes. like wormhole? Yeah, uh, it depends on. Like I've rendered some of this stuff on laptops, and I've had renders take like you know 24 hours total to to render out like a video uh, on like a laptop. For, especially when I was using older laptops and we were I was first trying to do like 4k videos that was a nightmare um, I have a system that's built for it now so I can render out 8k time lapses a little bit easier you know I can I can probably push an 8k video out in an hour or two but um, yeah it's it's crazy how much power uh, these time lapses take and I was using MacBook pros before. And I do love using Apple's interface, like their, um, what is it, operating system. I found it to be more intuitive, and I've also found that uh, the like MacBook Pros are more stable than. But I I needed to switch to PC because I couldn't afford getting like a Mac Pro for what I needed. Like I think the equivalent of like I got my system. It's a pretty powerful video editing machine for about four thousand dollars. I think it was like a little over four thousand dollars. That same system that I built for like a Mac Pro would have costed me, I think I looked it up and it was like 14 grand. And it's like, well, you know, do I want to buy a computer or do I want to buy a car? You know what I mean? Like I can't, it's just not worth it for me to stay with Mac when the the overhead was like an extra 10 grand, yeah. you know? So Huge. I switched to PC and got a pretty good system. Even my, like my Dell, I have a Dell laptop. This is not a plug for, for <laughs> Dell at all. To no, be honest with you, for Dell. <laughs> to, to be honest with you, the, the interface of this Dell system is kind of quirky. Like there's things I really don't like about it, yeah. but, um, like even this Dell laptop that I've got, that's like a, I think it's a six core. It, it can render 8k time lapses like pretty fast surprisingly so you know the newer the newer systems that are coming out are, are definitely better but yeah i needed a pretty powerful machine to handle all the video editing i do yeah we got one last question i'm going to do because i'm conscious that we need to to wrap things up but before i, I wrap up uh if you've been enjoying this episode please hit that like button give us a thumbs up uh really supports the channel really appreciate it the other thing you can do is you can hit that subscribe button you can hit that little bell notification that way you will be notified of every episode we got coming you like that you like that mm -hmm. it's kind of cool, cool uh, little bell like sorry yeah. <laughs> that's cool i mean everybody likes the animation the, the hardest bit is remembering what hand to use to to point at it the uh but yeah hit that subscribe button you'll be notified uh if you hit the bell notification whenever we release another episode uh later this week on thursday we will be joined by john rourke who's been watching today thanks john he's going to give us a great insight into what it takes to photograph you know high adrenaline endurance motorsport and uh, he's an incredible photographer has one of the most artistic eyes that I know uh, that makes his work very, very different from what you typically expect uh, from motorsport. So come join us on Thursday for that. Hit the subscribe button. It really does uh, help us support this channel and all the work that we do here. One last question before we finish up, which is from a great supporter of this channel. Gary Monroe asks, do you have a dream time lapse you have yet to capture? Hmm. I really wanted to capture the um, Milky Way in the Southern Hemisphere for a long, long time, and I just didn't have the opportunity for for uh, years. And then I finally did it last year. Early last year, I went to New Zealand and I got like a Milky Way shot of the Southern Hemisphere, Milky Way over uh, this layer of fog. So. No, you know what? I, I love time-lapse photography, and I'm going to continue to do it. I have 
projects that I want to keep working on, like new projects that I want to release and share. Like I've been working on a Southwest time lapse for a while now, like an 8K Southwest time lapse that I'm really excited to share. And hopefully I can share that um, before the end of the year or maybe early next year. But I don't have like a dream time lapse shot that I want to do necessarily. I just I just want to continue keep making projects that I'm proud of. Um, as long as I'm out there having fun shooting time lapse, I think the things that I would have dreamed up are things that happen spontaneously too. Like, you know, you, you know, when you're just out in a landscape and something incredible happens that you never would have expected to happen, like a rainbow appears out of nowhere and suddenly you're time lapsing a rainbow right above a mountain peak. It's things like that, that like I never would have ever dreamed I could capture, but end up happening. Um, so not necessarily things that I'm dreaming up in my head, but things that I, things that end up making me feel like I'm dreaming when I'm out there shooting, if, if that's a good answer to that. Yeah. Lots of, lots of great comments. Thank you, Smug Mug and Michael, for this wonderful presentation. Thanks awesome so much. show. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, John says, looking forward to seeing you all on Thursday. John, we're really looking forward to seeing your incredible motorsport work. Uh, excellent show, Alistair. Great stuff, Michael. Stay thank safe, you. everyone. And that is a great way to finish up the show. Michael, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. You know, you and I could talk for another two hours, and I'm sure everybody would uh, would hang about and listen. But uh, <laughs> look forward to hopefully catching up again soon. We do have a plan still to do a longer kind of feature length smug mug film with yourself. Hopefully we go somewhere really cool in the world to do that. We just don't know when that's going to be quite yet. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully sooner than later. <laughs> I hope so. Um, you know, yeah. hopefully, hopefully at some point 2021, I guess, but <laughs> we'll see how, how travel pans out. But Michael, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it as always. Uh, everybody Thanks out so there, stay safe, you know, be good, be kind, look after each other. And we'll see you back here for another episode of Smug Mug Live. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, folks.